first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for coming over here tonight to listen to the seminar. I know some of you um, will be taking bonus points away from this, but I also want you to take the relationship that will be brought both with food security and any um, economic principle that will be said. Um, the presentation tonight will be about food security by Professor Pierre de Rochers. Yes. Um, the theme is the case against local tourism and food sovereignty, historical perspective on long distance trade, economic development, environmental protection, and food security. Too many people are unaware of the reasons of having motivated the development, the development of unfair reliability and security of global food supply chain. This wouldn't be problematic. This wouldn't be problematic if local food activists hadn't successfully pushed the idea of drastically in increasing our reliance on local food production in the name of improving food security, saving family farms, creating jobs, de delivering better nutrition, reducing environmental impact, and creating social capital. Professor De Roches will challenge these themes, including the fact that activists call for putting all of one's food security eggs in one regional basket, as opposed to relying on multiple distant supplies. Natural catastrophes spare no region and do not discriminate between crops, no matter how diverse a local food system might be. As a result, most people have historically struggled with recurring famine and malnutrition. As a result, most people have only the development of effective long distance transportation made it possible to challenge the surplus of regions that the good years to those that had bad when eradicating some of humanity's worst scourges. The diversification of food supply sources is one of the great unappreciated wonders of our age. Its further development is the best way to improve the security of humanity for food supply, with some agency develop economic development and economic improvement. I would like to call Mr. Daniel Thompson, the Chair of the School of Business and Hospitality Management, to give remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again to students and our guests, Professor DeRocha and the representatives from the Nassau Institute. Indeed, we're excited to be a part of this, our second seminar for this year. And uh, this represents a relationship that has existed for some time now. And uh, our representative with the Institute, Professor Randy Forbes, must be commended for his involvement and uh, participation in the organizing of, in the organization of this event. Let's give him an applause, please. Oftentimes, over the last few years, when the Institute presents at the university, uh, they seem to be pick or select topics that are, in my mind, very unique, very sometimes controversial, but nonetheless very current. And uh, my background, I come from a background as an agricultural economist, and as I spoke with Professor DeRoshi, I told him I have an appreciation for the whole issue of food security and the whole issue of indigenous and local individuals to try to, in their mind, enhance their food security by diversifying their agricultural and food production. And uh, I'm quite aware of the issues involved at the local political level in that regard. And uh, as we look at the local boards and their efforts to involve in um, near production, near site production, and consumption of their goods. We appreciate the importance of it at the local level, but yet the, because of the global and internationalization of trade and its various attributes, we recognize this limitation. And as we look at these, at these situations, my perspective is that there's always a balance, a balance between, on the one hand, international trade, and on the other hand, I'm looking at local and indigenous populations. And I trust that as, as Professor DeRocha speaks, that you are students in your mind that you critically um, assess that balance. <coughs> One, the need for trade, 
and on the other hand, the local component. And uh, perhaps some of his thoughts, will, as I read uh, some of his, his writings, appear to be very controversial to some degree, but that's a part of what academia is all about. And we welcome the perspective in this forum, and we expect that our students will engage in, question him, challenge his premises, and uh, hopefully produce uh, some good responses, and it will impact our learning experience here at the university. So we're excited to have you, and um, of course, speak as you, from your philosophical perspective, and indeed, we will question from our own philosophical perspective as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure and a joy to once again have the institution's involvement in the life of our students so that they can become more critical thinkers. In fact, it is events such as these where students are engaged and exposed to international scholars. These type of forum can help you in terms of developing your future career, perhaps as a result of these seminars you may decide to take a profession in academia, looking at some aspects of economics. And so we welcome these seminars. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much and wish you have a successful um, evening. Unfortunately, I have a, another engagement, so I will be leaving you shortly. And I wish you all the best. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dawson, for those warm remarks. I will now invite Jer Mr. Jeremiah Taylor, our Vice President of the Ethno Society of the University of the Bahamas, who will now introduce the guest speaker. Please have a good afternoon. Professor Pierre Desrochers, Senior Fellow at the Fraser Institute, is an Associate Professor of Geography at the University of Toronto, Mrs. Mississauga. His main research interests include economic development, energy, environmental and urban policy, and food policy. He holds a PhD in Geography from the University of Montreal. He spent two years at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, as a postdoctoral fellow. He has published more than 50 academic articles and over 200 economic columns in various outlets. Prior to joining the University of Toronto, Mr. Desrochers was the Montreal Economic Institute's research director, where he remains a senior fellow. <coughs> Earlier this summer, Professor Pierre Desrochers received the 2017 Julian L. Simon Memorial Award at the annual dinner of Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. for the community of scholars. It was a great choice. Dr. DeRose Shares has carried the torch for Julian Simon's legacy for more than two decades. Noted CEI President Ken Glassman said, his defense of modern large-scale agriculture and critique of the concept of food miles in the Lockerbie's dilemma informs any recent discussion on how to improve the health and wealth of people everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome <coughs> Professor Dinger Shims. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone. Thanks to my host, thanks to the uh, University of the Bahamas, thanks to the Nassau Institute. So um, I apologize in advance if you struggle with my accent. So as the name uh, gives it away, I'm French Canadian and I only began speaking English when I was 19. And that's because I grew up in a very small rural town in Quebec uh, where my parents, among other things, were apple and maple syrup producers. So that's my claim to actually know something about agriculture. Now, I don't know how many of you have had maple syrup, but as is sometimes the case, you know, you grew up in an environment and the way you produce maple syrup is that you get the sap from the trees and you boil it and you reduce it. 
And I did so much of that as a kid that I can't stand maple syrup today. <laughs> so I don't know if some of you are, come from fishing communities or other kinds of agricultural communities, but you know, sometimes you're born in an environment and you just can't stand it anymore. But this has nothing to do with what I have to say tonight. I'm not against local food because I can't stand maple syrup. <laughs> so uh, the title is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll spare it to you. But in essence, what I want to do is uh, challenge some of the foundations of the rhetoric of what has been uh, called uh, locovorism or um, the push to buy uh, or to produce more food locally at the expense of importing food uh, from further away. So what I want to do at first is uh, survey those basic ideas and then tell you how our system became globalized and why this was so. And then I will look specifically at what I believe are five um, wrong-headed myths that are used to make the case uh, for locovorism. So I'll spare you the details and you'll see them as I go along. Now I have a lot of images. Um, I apologize, but I believe that an image is worth a thousand words and so you'll get a lot of words tonight. So the call of the local. So if you're not familiar with the expression, uh, is this good? Am I speaking okay? In the, okay. So herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat meat, and locovores eat local. Now, why should we make an extra effort to buy local? So this is something that I got from a local newspaper in Ontario. Um, Ten reasons to buy local. Everything from the food tastes better, it's good for the community, it's safer, it uh, keeps your hard-earned money in your local community, and it's about the future, whatever that means. So, you know, people put forward a number of reasons for that, but I've tried to sum them up under five headings. So in a way, I view that as being backward as the new forward, because if you know a little bit about the development of our food system, it was not too long ago that even in the richest uh, economies, so this is a painting from London from over a century ago, uh, you know, people would consume mostly local food and it would be sold in uh, outdoor stalls and it, it was, you know, the fate, in mo it was how food was produced and consumed in most agricultural, so in all agricultural societies throughout history until the fairly recent past. So obviously then you've got to ask yourself, well, if things were so great when most food was local, why did so many people work so long and so hard to develop the globalized food system that we have today? After all, again, uh, I must confess, I'm not, I don't know much about tropical agriculture. I don't know much about the Bahamas, but you know, this is a painting from uh, Ireland uh, over a century and a half ago. And like many French Canadians, I have Irish roots. Uh, you know, a lot of Irish people escaped their island when it was uh, subjected to famine and because they were Catholic it was okay to marry them so because my in Quebec you had to be Catholic to be allowed to move to Canada so I have uh, Irish blood in me and some of it is related to that past famine but you go into any less developed economy today and of course today most people at least those who live in the countryside and many who live in the city tend to produce uh, their own food and historically, obviously, this was the case when you did not have refrigeration or uh, modern transportation. So if you look at the history of cities like uh, Florence and the Renaissance, London and the Middle Ages, everything that was perishable would travel at most uh, 50 kilometers. I mean, milk and eggs will not travel far, as you know, but even meat, if you could not uh, smoke it or put it in brine, would not travel all that far. So uh, chicken, pigs uh, were once very common in advanced economies. In many parts of the world today, they still are in cities. Again, this is just how people uh, keep uh, fresh meat when you don't have access to refrigeration. Uh, this is central London, the city of London, uh, two centuries ago. And uh, the spots in yellows is where milk uh, was being produced. So what people would do is that they would either bring animal feed into the city or else they would feed them a brewery leftover. So you would produce beer, you would be left with the mash, you would feed it to cows instead of wasting it. Now this is a, a, a structure that I liked a lot. Um, this, was, this is a, a greenhouse that was built in the late 18th century, so in the late 1700s. So most of you here probably know that pineapples are originally from this part of the world and that uh, sending them back to a leaky sail, through a leaky uh, sailboat uh, in England was not a possibility. So if you wanted pineapples uh, in Europe uh, two centuries ago, you had to produce them in greenhouses. And back then only rich people could afford greenhouses and they were the only one 
that would eat fresh produce year-round. So this is uh, a structure that was built by one of the richest men in uh, the United Kingdom, the Earls of uh, Dunmore in Scotland. And it's been estimated that in today's money, producing one pineapple would cost 3,000 American dollars. Uh, you could buy a horse carriage for that price of a pineapple back then. So that's how much you had to pay if you wanted uh, fresh local food in a place like Scotland, especially in the winter. Now, another thing that people don't realize is that, of course, I was telling you that historically most food was produced locally, but people don't realize how sophisticated some of these systems were. So this is in the suburbs of Paris in the uh, late uh, 19th century. So there are a few things I would like to draw your attention to. I don't know if, uh, okay, do you see the little arrow here? So look at the tree. Uh, this is in the winter. Uh, you can see those walls here. Walls were built all around gardens around Paris because uh, you could create a microclimate that way, get a few additional degrees centigrade. You can see people are uh, growing produce <coughs> under what are called clush. Um, everything would be soaking in horse manure because the picture was taken before cars came along and so there was plenty of horse manure available. And in order to create additional uh, degrees, additional heat in the winter, people would put straw mats that they had painted black on top of them. And so through uh, systems, like, through innovations like that, uh, as late as the late 19th century, about one-sixth of Paris area was devoted for, for, to food production. Uh, they would grow about 100,000 tons of produce each year. Uh, the first thing that people there could produce year-round, even in the winter, were green asparagus. But by the late 19th century, because pineapples are so expensive and so lucrative, pineapples are actually being produced around Paris. Uh, by then, the price is not $3,000. I haven't been able to find out much, but there's still enough of an incentive uh, to build around Paris. So this is how the system looked a few years later. Cloches are gone, new systems are created. Uh, this is north of Paris, and what people managed to do back then was to convert the sewage system into a source of fertilizer and grow <coughs> produce in there. This is a drawing of what uh, one of the suburbs of Paris looked like. If you ever travel there, especially on the north side of Paris, because this is the way uh, water naturally flows out of the city, you can still see remnant of, the, of that time. You see some of those old agricultural structures in the suburbs of Paris. But then everything changes at about that time. So in the late 19th century, uh, in the early 20th century, what happens is what we call the 19th uh, century transportation revolution. So uh, coal comes along, the steam engine, and out of these come the railroad and the steamship. And so suddenly uh, you've got this marketing plan that says, well, why would you buy crappy local product when you can have access to the best that the world has to offer? So this is an advertisement from uh, Cape Cod Cranberries. So Cape Cod is near Boston. And basically what they're telling you is that, well, why don't you buy the, the, the world's best cranberries? You don't need to buy the local stuff. Buy the best stuff. We can deliver it at a price that you can afford. So again, uh, people today don't, uh, don't realize how much of an advance um, the railroad was. But you can see, of course, a muddy road as opposed to the railroad, the amount of food that you can deliver, the speed, uh, the low economic cost. Uh, steamships come along, uh, so does refrigeration. So uh, I was on TV apparently yesterday, I think it was shown last night, and I was debating um, New Zealand lamb. Why is it that we import New Zealand lamb? Well, they have the best pasture land in the world for lamb, and they've been shipping the stuff uh, frozen uh, for over a century. Now, uh, this is the Bahamas. I feel like it's like selling refrigerators to Eskimos, I guess, or Inuits. But again, where I'm from, people don't realize that if you want to cross the ocean in a sailboat, you've got to factor in ocean currents and wind patterns. But when the steamships come, uh, comes along, you don't have to care about these anymore. You can go anywhere, anytime, and suddenly the whole uh, world opens up and prices go down and quantities that can carry on these boats uh, goes up. So the result is that our food supply becomes increasingly uh, globalized. So historically, the things that would travel uh, well at first were either very expensive or had no problems in terms of preservation. So things like dry cod, uh, wheat, uh, sugar, coffee. But of course, beginning in the late 19th century, frozen products, canning, refrigeration, other things come along. And over time, the world's food supply becomes less and less globalized. 
So by the early uh, 1900 in New York City, people consume produce uh, products that come from all over the world, either the American inland or tropical locations like this one or even much uh, further away. So tea, sugar, meat are things that um, the emerging middle class can afford, which was not the case uh, before. So the author of a book written in 1903 said all these things are found in a great majority of households and this is a good thing. Um, one of the first tropical products that finds its way to uh, the United States uh, market is bananas because as you, I'm sure you know, uh, bananas uh, don't need to be uh, refrigerated. I mean, you can trigger uh, their ripening. Nature provides the packaging free of charge. And again, bananas are the first, is the first tropical commodity that poor people in the United States uh, can afford. Okay, so what happens if you sort of, you look at it from a perspective of a bird, what changes occur in the landscape of the United States with the transportation revolution? Well, urban agriculture is driven out of cities. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, land value uh, in places like Paris uh, was extremely valuable. The city is growing, uh, people want to build houses, factories, uh, other things, and so people are willing to bid for the land that uh, uh, market gardeners is, are, are occupying and it's just no longer lucrative enough to produce uh, produce next to a city like Paris. At the same time, well, all that horse manure creates uh, public health issues, all those backyard chickens create public health issues, people want them gone, and uh, you would work very long hours to produce uh, food under cloche and stuff like that. So agric urban agriculture is just driven out, people have better alternatives. And what happens is that in rural areas where people were trying to produce a little bit of everything to satisfy their own needs, it becomes possible because of the railroad to specialize in what you do best and export that stuff to city and with the money that you earn to buy a wider array of goods. And so people stop trying to just to survive and specialize in what they do best. Uh, some productions move uh, to new areas or else people simply leave the countryside and move to the cities where it is much easier to escape poverty that way. So by the early 20th century, this is what has happened in the United States. Uh, regions have specialized in what they do best and they trade with each other. So if you buy cheese in the United States, it's probably coming from the Northeast. If you buy corn, if you're in a large city, it's probably coming from the Midwest. Uh, cotton obviously is not for eating, but cotton seed, the leftover byproduct, is used to feed the livestock, cattle at least, and then from that feeding cities. Uh, subtropical crops in the, the southern US and the Central Valley in California. And so people specialize in what they do best. You improve transportation, you have refrigeration, canning that comes along, and so regions specialize in what they do best, and they trade with each other. It's what economists call comparative advantage. In that case, it emerged over time. And as a result, food becomes more abundant and less expensive uh, in cities. Uh, the outcome number two is that, uh, again, with improvements in transportation and refrigeration, people stop storing food uh, year round. So if you wanted potatoes uh, in uh, New York City, for example, well, the first that you would uh, buy early in the year would come from uh, southern Florida, and I guess it's not that close, but also from Bermuda. Bermuda has been shipping potatoes for a very long time, as some of you may know. And later on in the years, well, potatoes ripen at different time, at different latitudes. And so again, the first potatoes come from southern Florida and Bermuda, but in September, they will come from uh, the northern part of the United States all the way up to the St. John River Valley in Maine. And so instead of storing potatoes year round in your root cellar, what people end up doing is that they buy fresh stuff year round that is delivered based on the time of ripening from a much larger uh, geographical area. Another thing that occurs that makes food ever more abundant and affordable is the concentration of processing. So with the railroad, what happens is that uh, you can actually move livestock over long distances. So until the railroad came along, most uh, cattle, for example, was produced uh, near final consumers. It would be walked into a city, slaughtered there. Uh, people would uh, sell the leather, would eat the meat, and would throw away everything else. But the railroad makes it possible to concentrate production in some very large facilities, like for example here, in uh, Chicago, in the middle of the United States, you can see the railroad network converging there. 
And what happens then is that you're able to generate economies of scale, so you can produce the meat and the leather a lot more cheaply than before. But at the same time, because you've got this mountain of waste products, there is an incentive to create as much value out of the stuff as possible. I mean, you pay for the whole animal, so you will try to make, uh, to extract value from the bones and from the organs that were not uh, consumed by people. So this is what um, people do with things other than meat and leather in the early 20th century. Uh, today we take plastics for granted, but plastic as we know it, uh, or plastics as we know them today did not exist at the time. So a lot of things, for example, were made out of animal bones and a lot of inedible parts were also turned into fertilizer. So the place is smelly, it's dirty. I mean, I can only imagine the smell, but nothing is wasted. Um, the expression back then is that everything is used but the squeal of the animal when you kill it. And that's because you're able to concentrate the processing in one location. Something that you couldn't do if you had only small butcher shops all over the country. Okay, so uh, I saw your big container report on the way in. I don't need to lecture you about this, but uh, people outside of island context or people who don't live close to port don't realize how efficient modern uh, <coughs> intermodal container shipping is. And uh, this has allowed us to move a lot of uh, fresh produce much faster uh, than before. So as you may know, uh, ships used to spend days, if not weeks or months and parts being loaded and unloaded. But uh, with modern container shipping, they can be out in 24, 36 hours or less, depending obviously on the size of the ship. So uh, refrigerated containers, they tend to be white. Again, I assume most of you know that, but trust me, it's not obvious to uh, colleagues your age where I'm from. So what has happened? Well, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, economies that were close to world markets reopened. So places like Vietnam, the Philippines, China, uh, they develop, they redevelop their comparative advantage. And because we can move things much faster and much more cheaply, uh, cheaply through container shipping, uh, we saw an increased, another wave of globalization of the food market uh, in the last generation. You know, I know that some of you were probably born and you know, apple juice from China was already there. Uh, but trust me, where I'm from, uh, that was quite a trauma. I mean, you never thought when I was a kid that the Chinese would one day uh, compete with you on one segment of uh, your market. Okay, so that's basically how we came to have the world that we have today and the basic economic logic that drove the globalization of our food supply. Now, this did not occur uh, without problems and that pretty much every step of the way you had people uh, who were opposed to that on a number of grounds. And so historically, you have a number of um, movements that try to stop this. Now, uh, this is a poster that I like a lot. Again, this is an old fashioned ship here. I don't know if you, if you get thing. This was produced uh, during the Second World War in Great Britain. So at the time you've got U-boats, uh, submarines that are sinking boats that, are, that belong you know, to the British Merchant Marine <coughs> Fleet, um, United States, Canada. I don't know if many boats left the Bahamas at the time, but in Canada, many boats are gathering in Halifax, uh, being grouped in big convoys and try to deliver food. Uh, to the United Kingdom, and obviously you've got German submarines trying to sink them along the way. So obviously in that case, you have an incentive to use spades, not ships. So try to produce as much food in the United Kingdom as you can. That way you put less lives at risk when people try to deliver food uh, from North America. But this is only one rational to promote local food, and this is obviously the least bad one. So historically you've had People promoting local food movements in times of economic downturns, uh, people who don't like big firms, economies of scale, and people who believe that anyone between a farmer and the person who sells the food to consumer is essentially a parasite. So I'll go over this quickly. So uh, in the United States, you've got a number of food movements. As soon as globalization or at least continentalization at first comes along, you've got various uh, local food movements that try to buck the trend, if you will. Um, so the first recurring motive historically is what I would say, it's a, it's a dislike of big corporations, of markets, 
of large anonymous entities. So uh, some people don't like big cities, other people don't like the spending on foreign suppliers, uh, people don't like corporations, and they don't like recent technological advances, whatever they might be. So at first people say that you know, shipping frozen meat will likely be bad to your, uh, to your health. Who knows what frozen meat will actually do to you? Uh, today's it's GMOs and it's other things, but there are always people opposed to the latest agricultural trends. So uh, there were movements in the early 1800s in places like Massachusetts. People say, no, no, let's keep the rice that we import from the Caribbeans out of here and let's try to revert back to uh, what we produce locally. Now, the most radical of these people opposed to globalization is Bronson Alcott. Uh, I don't expect you to know him, but uh, at the risk of something, well, um, his daughter turned out to be Louisa May Alcott of Little Woman fame. I don't know if that's still known. Okay, well, at least people of a certain age have heard of her. So um, he tries to create his own little settlement. And what he argues, he says, we should only eat what we produce. And it's called Fruitlands because he wants a simple diet, so mostly fruit and water. He doesn't want stimulants, and by that he means things like coffee and tea. I mean, who knows what coffee and tea will do to people and the change in behaviors that these things bring. Uh, he doesn't want animal products because we're cruel to animals. Um, and so, specifically, what he's against are coffee, tea, molasses, or rice. So if you're in the Caribbean and are looking for a market in New England at the time, I guess you're hoping that this guy's ideas won't become too popular. He's also against meat, butter, cheese, eggs, and milk, but also wool, manure, wax, and animal labor. Uh, for reasons that I've never quite understood, I'm still expecting that someone in an audience one day will give me the answer. He's opposed to vegetables that grow downwards, so carry carrots, beets, and potatoes. Because he argues they show a lower nature and they're not good for you. <laughs> I mean, I, st I still don't get the logic here. If, if any of you has any idea, well, let me know. And he's, <laughs> and he's opposed to cotton, and this I understand because he's against slavery, obviously. Okay. But fast forward uh, something like 70 years, and in the early 20th century, you already have people in Boston, New York, and other places who are tired of the urban rat race and want to move back to the countryside to enjoy a simpler life. So you've got a bunch of magazines and uh, people who cater, who cater to that movement in the early 20th century. Okay, so every time you have a war, obviously, so that, that's the kind of the romantic thing. Uh, war times, obviously, uh, most countries, most advanced economies become ever more dependent on other economies. The first thing that happens in uh, wartime is that whoever you're fighting is trying to cut your supply line, so there's obviously an incentive uh, to promote more food locally. But what's interesting about those movements is that they never last. Once the war is over, people revert back to buying cheaper stuff from elsewhere. <coughs> uh, this is a poster that's 100 years old. Uh, this was produced by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1917. Uh, basically, they say turn your uh, backyard and uh, your crabgrass into a garden, raise chickens. Uh, this is a school not far from the White House in Washington, D.C. So again, do your part for the war effort. Uh, but already in the 20th century, a number of people are worried that, especially immigrant kids who live in cities, in factory districts, don't know anything about agricultural production, so there is an incentive to promote local gardens or school backyards, uh, convert school backyards into gardens to teach uh, kids about agriculture. So some uh, books from about a century ago, so among school gardens, children's gardens. Every time there's a downturn, and jobs are scarce, there's also pressure to at least let poor people have access to vacant lot, uh, produce their own uh, potatoes, uh, their own produce. Uh, there are also a number of people, this is from a century ago, the back to the land movement begins back then. Uh, there was a big uh, depression in the United States in the uh, late 19, early 20th century. The idea is that we will never create new jobs, the robots <coughs> will take over, and so we should just move to the countryside, get back to the land, and you know, a little land and a uh, living. Um, every time also you have a depression, so this is Youngstown, Ohio, a big uh, steel, uh, steel town, so again, uh, people lose their job, at least they can grow their own food. Uh, there are also a number of uh, subsistence homestead that are created in the countryside. This is for people who lose their jobs in the coal mines in uh, West Virginia. There are also strategies that say, well, perhaps we could promote local food as a tool of economic development. So you have a number of these strategies in the early uh, 1920s in the United States. 
Uh, what I was telling you, the parasitical intermediaries. So uh, again, all those people who buy stuff from farmers, grade them, ship them, uh, are viewed as essentially parasites. So this is a quote from a century ago. So strawberries back then are mostly produced in the United States. If you live on the East Coast, they're produced in Delaware, uh, not too far from Washington, DC. Uh, then they're shipped to Philadelphia and then they're shipped back and they transit. And uh, basically what the fellow argues here is that any quality that is left in the berries after they've traveled so much is due rather to the providence of God than to the wisdom of man. So uh, transportation is viewed as wasted values and intermediaries are parasites that don't add anything. So that's uh, always been another recurring concern. Okay, so I've limited myself to American examples, but you say you have the same rhetoric elsewhere. So a few examples of mine that I really like. Uh, the Empire Marketing Board. So in the 1920s, there is a movement to promote uh, purchases of goods produced in the British Empire. So in that case, local food is defined as the whole British Empire. So the Bahamas were obviously part of that, but I couldn't find a poster that dealt specifically with the Bahamas. You've got posters you know, from India, South Africa, uh, Rhodesia and other parts of the empire, but you know, a growing export trade is the ba basis of British prosperity, support your best customer, keep your money in the empire. So the empire then is considered uh, local. So buy British for the empire at home and overseas. Um, dictators the world over are also very keen to uh, promote local food whenever they take over. So uh, this is Mussolini, uh, fascist dictator in Italy, when fascist actually meant something as opposed to today. Um, editorial comment. Uh, <laughs> Soviet Union. Uh, Nicola Ceausescu, he was a communist dictator in Romania. Uh, you're too young to know anything about him, but older people will probably agree with me that he met the fate that he deserved. So, and I'll leave it at that. You can Google him, Nicolas Ceausescu. So uh, one of the first thing that Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy does when he takes over is to try to boost uh, wheat production in Italy. Uh, he will achieve his goal, but he can only do that by cutting down on the production of citrus fruit, olives, uh, grapes, things that Italians are actually good at. And so he achieves his goal, but the price of wheat goes up and the other stuff is less available but he wanted to cut Italy's dependence on imports. Okay, so the thing is though, every time people are free to do what they want, they don't care about these movements. They don't buy from the British Empire. The war, the war is over, they begin buying from other locations. Why is that? Well, what I argue in the book and elsewhere is that the alleged benefits of locavorism, of buying local food at the expense of international trade uh, are simply non-existent. And people realize that very quickly. So uh, let me first state the obvious. As far as I know, we don't import food from outer space. So, you know, we don't import food from the moon, from Mars. Uh, I don't know, stranger things might exist. I have no idea. But the implication is that as far as I can tell, good quality, affordable food needs to be grown somewhere on Earth. So at any given time, the best apples, the best sugar cane, the best pineapples will be grown somewhere. And it obviously makes sense for people who grew up next to these productions to actually consume the stuff because it's the best that is produced the world over. The problem then that I have with local food movements is that it's not pushing local when it's sensible. If the best food at any given point in time is produced in your backyard, in your neighborhood, in your country, well, you will buy it simply because it gives you the best quality for the best price. You don't need a local food campaign to buy local stuff when it's the best thing that is available on the market. So in that context, you can only understand this local food movement, this locavorism movement, to argue that you should make an extra effort to buy local food, even if it doesn't give, even if it's not the most affordable, the most nutritious, the safest, or even the tastiest food. Otherwise, there's no point in pushing local food because if it's the best, people will buy it anyway. So in other words, local wars eat local, but you must make an effort to pay more for a lesser quality and to cut down on imports if this movement is gonna have any real implications. Okay, why should we do that? Well, one argument that is put forward by local food activists is that we don't know our farmers and therefore we're spiritually or uh, socially poor as a result. 
say, okay, fine. I mean, uh, I don't know who produces my food, and perhaps if I got to uh, know who produces my food, I'd feel better, and it would help the local community. Uh, so again, get rid of all those parasitical intermediaries, buy directly from the farmer to community-supported agriculture or some other scheme, and you know, forget about barcodes and uh, brand bullies. You know, buy stuff from the people you know rather than from your supermarket. Okay, the problem is that um, if you go back in time, you see that people were forever complaining about local food producers. You know, they would add uh, rice powder to uh, milk, they would add chicory to coffee, you could not really trust what you were buying locally. And uh, this fellow here is a German who, related, who relocated to the United Kingdom, and he published something called a Treatise on the Adulteration of Food and Culinary Poison, and he describes the various way local retailers will add stuff in the food that they buy. Nowadays, the main problem that you have, and I don't know if the joke will work here, is that uh, the only true local characteristic of an apple that you will buy at a farmer's market in Toronto is that it might come from the local Costco. There's repeated frauds. There was, again, a report on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation not too long ago where they follow farmers who grow corn on their farm. They have a farm. But then what they do is that they go to the central terminal in Toronto, they buy apples, they go to the farmer's market, they say, oh yeah, I have a farm, I have a farm, that's from my farm. No, it's local, at least they got it at the central food terminal in Toronto, but it might be from British Columbia, Washington State, what have you. And this reminds us why brands, grades, and standard emerge historically. How do you establish trust in a market when you don't know the producers? Well, typically you tend to trust the brand. And the brand emerged, again, so that food could be gathered from multiple producers. And you knew, for example, Quaker Oats in the United States was one of the first brand. Uh, the people who created that had nothing to do with Quakers. They knew that Quakers had a good image. I mean, they were Anglicans or something. I have no idea. But even though they might have lied about this, you knew that when you bought your box of Quaker Oats in Montreal, Buffalo, Miami, or Los Angeles, you would get the same stuff, basically. And so trust in a market is established to brands. Or else when you go and you see those apples that all look similar, for example, it's a particular grade, well, they were selected that way. And that's how you build trust when you don't know the producers. And so what I would argue is that typically when you go to a farmer's market, you pay more for your food. Um, you typically need to drive the extra mile, often you have bad parking condition, and as a result of all of that, you have less money and less time to do other things. Uh, coach little league soccer, give to your local church, or what have you. So local capital can be built up in uh, many ways. And if you spend more money and devote more time to acquire your food, well then you have less of other opportunities to contribute to the creation of social capital. Okay, in terms of economic prosperity, again, nobody would bother importing food from long distances if it was not cheaper for the same quality. So that means that if you buy local food that is more expensive, then you have less money to spend on other things. And so you might create a few inefficient farming jobs in your community, but you destroy a number of other jobs, both in your community and abroad. And having less money to spend is not a good way to create wealth and improve standards of living. Uh, there's also the issue of economies of scale, but also especially from uh, less developed economies. All economies develop by selling stuff to people who are richer than them. I mean, that's one of the, the basic laws of economic development. So if you block access to your market from people whose best path to development is exporting agricultural product, how is that helping them? So you're penalizing local consumers in economies where people have more money and you're penalizing producers in economies where people have less money. You don't create economic development that way. Okay, in terms of the environment, um, the main issue is what has been known is what is now known as food miles. Are you familiar with the expression? No, yes, okay, well, okay, basically the idea is, is that things are the same everywhere, and if you buy local product, uh, basically you don't need to move it over long distances. Uh, long distance transportation today is powered at 95% from uh, carbon fuels, you know, various petroleum products, uh, diesel uh, bunker fuels, uh, gasoline in lesser cases. And so the idea is that when you buy local, you cut all this transportation away. Now maybe uh, you'll get the joke here. So these are apples. 
And this is an apple where you have both a palm tree and an apple tree. I didn't do that, but uh, if you know where that island is, I'm still looking for it. <laughs> I'd like to know the ecosystem that can both support apple trees and palm trees of some kind. So in other words, food miles are obviously valid when everything else is equal. But you know, I'm a geographer and you might say, oh, why are we wasting taxpayers' money having geographers teaching geography courses? Well, one of the rationale for my existence is to remind people that the world is not the same, that everywhere is the same. And there are such things as locations that are better to produce certain commodities than others. So for example, if you look at two island nations that are at roughly the same latitude, although at different, uh, in different hemispheres, uh, the United Kingdom and New Zealand, you might think, okay, well, are there big production differences in uh, between uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom? Surely not. Well, actually there are. And so for example, in New Zealand, using the same amount of input, you know, labor, uh, fertilizers, pesticide, fungicide, what have you, you can produce three times more apple, four times more lamb, and two times more milk solid, you know, everything from milk powder to casein to uh, dairy products generally, than in the United Kingdom. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, in the case of milk solid, for example, uh, the pasture land in New Zealand is actually of much better quality uh, than the United Kingdom. So uh, clover was imported in New Zealand. It became rampant everywhere. So um, the New Zealanders are also very good at managing their pasture. And so what happens is that if you want to produce milk, you need to give a lot of nutrition to your cows. But if your pasture land provides more nutrition, you don't need to give as much uh, supplemental feed uh, to your dairy cows. And because the pasture land in New Zealand is so much better than the United Kingdom, you can, using the same amount of input, <coughs> produce two times more uh, milk solids. So again, even in environments that might look similar, you often have differences that explain why people ship things over long distances. That's because the productivity differentials are significant. Uh, as you probably also know, uh, moving things on container ship, uh, through container ships is extremely efficient. Uh, these things float on water, they have huge diesel engine. Uh, it's been estimated that the cost of bringing one apple from New Zealand to uh, the Los Angeles Harbor is one cent per apple. One cent. Can you compete with that? Uh, there's also the timing uh, of the harvest. So uh, I guess this is less obvious maybe in tropical locations, but uh, where I grew up, we would typically pick apples in September and October. But if you go in the Southern Hemisphere where seasons are inverted, they tend to pick their apples in March and April. So um, in Canada, for example, if you want to consume an apple, uh, a local apple in uh, May or June, well, typically you pick it in September and then you keep it in cold storage uh, for several months. Or you can import apples from New Zealand that were picked like two or three weeks before and see them delivered into uh, your supermarket. So uh, the time of ripening, the time at which you pick your uh, apple in that case, more than makes up for the fact that you would leave uh, your local apples in cold storage. So it's often, you know, when, is, when are crops produced in particular parts of the world and how much storage do you need to do to uh, deliver that to local um, markets. But of course this works both ways. So New Zealand produces a lot of kiwis, but at certain times of the year when you go into New Zealand, you will see kiwis from Italy. And again, it's the same logic. Uh, they ripen at very different times, and so it's storage against transportation. And in most cases, uh, transportation is cheaper and therefore has less of an environmental impact than uh, storage. So overall, transportation in the United States, that's a rough figure, take it for what it's worth, but Long distance transportation is about 4% of the environmental impact of food production, whereas the production, you know, again, irrigation, water, uh, preparing the seeds, pesticide, fungicides, about 83% of the environmental impact. So if you cut transportation, everything else goes up and you have more environmental impact that way. Another thing that people don't realize is that as we've concentrated food production in the best locations the world over, a lot of agricultural land has been abandoned. And for example, the United States today, this is the extent of the forest cover in the United States in 1920, those dark areas. This is what it looks like today. And that's because a lot of uh, areas that were producing food, but where the conditions were really not good, have been abandoned. And people moved to the cities and the world is greener as a result. 
Okay, now in terms of food security, the standard argument made by local food producers is that, well, if you put all your eggs in one type of crop, if something goes wrong, uh, you'll have a problem. If you try to produce a bunch of different things, well, at least some things might survive and you'll put yourself at less risks. But what this forgets is that uh, what you're doing in that context is that you're putting all your food security eggs in one regional basket. Now again, in Canada, people don't understand these things, but you know what hurricanes and other things can do here. It doesn't matter how diversified you are, bad things will happen. Uh, so this is a uh, render pest or cattle plague, uh, never reached the Americas or uh, Australasia, so we've been lucky that way, but this is what happens in the uh, early 20th century in South, uh, South Africa. A lot of people die as a result, especially local tribes that depended on local food. But again, uh, in some parts of the world, you've got a bunch of insects coming over, they eat everything, they don't discriminate, uh, flood, frost where I'm from, frost will kill anything if you have a late or early frost. And so what we know from the analysis of the historical data is that historically most people suffered from famine and malnutrition the world over, whatever their agricultural food system was. Uh, famine were only uh, terminated or vanquished as people become, uh, became less and less dependent on their local food shed. So the more you rely on multiple supplier and the more you're part of that uh, globalized chain too, the more you can either help people who have bad harvest by sending your surplus or the more these people can help you if you have a bad year. And so more trade, uh, more sources of supply actually make you uh, more food secure. This was something that's been understood as long as uh, long distance transportation has been uh, available. Okay, I'm almost done, bear with me. <laughs> Mid five, nutrition and safety. So the idea is that local food, because it is fresher, it tastes better and it's more nutritious. Okay, but you have a problem here because as most parts of the world, local food is only available, you know, for a few weeks or a few months. If that is true, and actually it isn't, because if you freeze your food, it tends to be just as nutritious, then how can local food be more nutritious than getting fresh food from the world over? If you have to can your food, if you have to put it in your root cellar, how can that be better if the idea is that fresher is tastier and more nutritious? Um, Another issue that people don't quite understand is that the things that kill you are not uh, <coughs> synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, but things that are completely natural like uh, Salmonella and E. coli. And the beauty of the globalized food supply chain is that food tends to be sent, remember that uh, Chicago Meatpacking District, but you know, a lot of food tends to be sent to big processing centers where it is tested before being sent back. And it is, uh, there are economies of scale in food safety that you cannot have at the local level. And again, um, if you look at, for example, the deadliest outbreak, uh, 25 people died in the United States from listeriosis a couple of years ago, uh, that came from an organic farm that did not use pesticides. But these things here are very good at keeping um, things like listeriosis that in that case came from manure, it was not handled properly, it did not follow uh, the safety procedures that you would have in a large processing facility where you have uh, very complex and elaborate food safety protocols. Uh, so, you know, small might be beautiful, but bigger is often better and it is typically the case in terms of food safety. Uh, I don't know about the Bahamas, but in Canada, you know, the big thing these days is uh, can we trust the Chinese in terms of what they're selling us, you know? <laughs> Uh, and uh, what, I, what I argue there is that ultimately you don't trust the Chinese, you trust your supermarket and the people that they've bought from. And it might come as a shock to some of you, but poisoning your customers is usually not a winning business strategy. So I think the track record there is pretty safe. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, what are locavores really up against? Is it just, you know, large corporation, greedy <coughs> capitalist, uh, crushing the small farmer? Uh, not really. I mean, I think, again, our globalized food system evolved the way it did for a number of considerations. Uh, bad local weather, hurricane, earthquakes, um, frost, flood, droughts. Um, you won't escape having bad years wherever you are, whatever uh, your agricultural system is. And the more you spread out the risk, the safer you will be. Uh, some parts of the world are just better at other than others at producing certain types of crops. 
Again, I mean, you could probably try to produce maple syrup here. Uh, I guess you would need something of a refrigerator as opposed to a greenhouse to grow some maple trees, but it obviously doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are such things as economies of scale in terms of production and processing and distribution. And again, the one way to really lift people out of poverty that has worked in the past is to get people out of the countryside, move them into cities. But cities can only be supply uh, through our uh, global uh, food supply chain. There's no economy in the world that produces enough to feed a large city of many million people uh, with local food. Uh, some food for tots. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Napoleon. So at one point, he basically controls all of Western Europe except the United Kingdom and uh, Ireland. And he decides to bring them to their knees by uh, cutting trade with them. Now, if you're a local food activist, you should actually cheer for Napoleon here because he's obviously encouraging the Brits or maybe, you know, uh, Nazi U-boats commanders in the Second World War are really trying to promote more sustainable practices in Britain. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, people understood that trade is actually beneficial, and if you want to hurt people, you force them to revert back to whatever it is that they were doing before uh, their economies became globalized. And historically, well, local food suck. I'll spare you the details here, but uh, ideas have consequences. If you promote localism, especially by having government promote an efficient farming, preventing foreign food from entering your market, you know what the results will be. Higher costs and greater poverty, no environmental and social benefits, less food security and poorer nutrition, and a significant penalty to developing economies. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, do I take questions or do you want to match? Is there any questions? Was I so convincing? <laughs> Can't believe it. Uh, yes, please. You in the Bahamas? Yes. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, yes. <laughs> okay. One of the challenges um, we have is we're a young nation. Yes. Okay. And the opportunities that are available to us in the Bahamas are actually from agriculture mm -hmm. and marine resources. Yes. Now, we know, we know and we recognize that the form of farming that took place 50 years ago mm -hmm. or 100 years ago. And we also know that the technology has advanced mm -hmm. considerably. Mm -hmm. And so we know that some of the methods that we used, let's say, even 25 years ago, those are not going to work. Mm -hmm. But the argument or, or the case, mm -hmm. that's, not a, that's not a suitcase, right? No, that's a case. That's a big case. That's a big with, case. with lots of arguments. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the case against, in your presentation, you actually gave us why we should be doing it. Yes. <laughs> why we should focus on expanding our agricultural sector, yes. not just in the backyard, mm -hmm. that's good, but also throughout, in our case, throughout the Bahamas. Yes. Now, yesterday, we may not have had a comparative advantage, yes. but we have learned. Mm -hmm. We've learned from our mistakes. And today, just as New Zealand, Brazil, mm -hmm. South America, United States, Canada, have deployed some more efficient yes. methods. Yes. Right? Genius and intelligence have no nationality. I completely agree with you. So I'm sure that there are we some could, things that you can produce here that could, you could we export. We could do some stuff here yes. as well. Yes. And I understand the thing about economies of scale, yes. diversification of risks, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. But when you're going to produce a half a billion okay, yeah. of apples, yes. and those apples are going to make me sick, what are they worth? You don't have to answer that. Well, I, I'm pretty sure my, my family never killed anyone, or at least not conscientiously. I use apple as an example. Well, yeah, but it's close to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> it need Careful not be apple. It okay. could not be apple. Okay. It could be oranges, or it could be something okay. else. I just use that as an example. Yes. So, so I'm saying, 
Economies of scale, yes. Yes. It could benefit us. Yes. Because of the lower cost per unit production. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, you have two strategies. If you look at farmers that do well, either you produce for the mass market or you produce uh, very sophisticated apples for the Japanese market. You know, if you go to Tokyo, they're very fond of those huge apples. I don't know where they come from. You know, they will pay $10 for an apple. Yeah. So it's like the car market. You know, you've got the high end, you've got the product, you've got uh, mass production. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, th the point is that I don't know what the Bahamas is good at. Uh, but there's got to be something, and there are clever people here, and you've got certain weather conditions, and uh, there should be ways that to produce stuff that people elsewhere will want to buy, and that's what you should do as opposed to try to pr protect inefficient people who will charge you more to feed your local population. That's the case I'm making. I'm not against food production in the Bahamas, but people have to find their niche and hopefully rely on the export market. Good, very good. Okay. As a matter of fact, we don't have a choice. Well, to exactly. In, um, okay. More in agriculture. Actually, Thank you. Because we need to decrease our imports so that our net. Well, you need to earn extra currencies. So exactly. I, I think you should. I, I think you should import more. But the way you import more is by exporting more. So, yeah. okay. Any other question? Yes. Um, I'd like to read um, an excerpt from Spore magazine. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. But it's a magazine that is um, promotes rural develop uh, development in rural areas um, in okay, I'm listening. countries. Okay. okay. Um, so it's a long article talking about the rise of NCDs in developing nations. Sure. Yeah. And the end of it, I'll cut to the chase. The lack of attention to local food production is the main cause of obesity in both regions, meaning mm. the Pacific countries and the Caribbean. I disagree. Look at me, and it's not because of local <laughs> food. <laughs> in addition, uh, lack of attention to local food production. In yes. addition to dependence on high-calorie, low-nutrient imported foods, a combination that leads to a situation in which people are overweight yet yeah. malnourished. Okay, so what I will tell you there is that for the first time in human history, poor people are fat. So, yeah, that's a problem. But it still meets malnutrition and starvation in my book. Dying. Yes, but I mean, well, exactly. So I mean, th the way I look at that is that people have more opportunities than before. I'm not overweight because I consume too much local food. I'm overweight because I eat too much. And I have opportunities and, you know, that, that's kind of my main exercise every day. I sit at my keyboard and uh, so I haven't been very good in going to the gym these last few years, but uh, I'm trying to work on that and hopefully I'll succeed one day. But the point is that people now have more opportunities than before. And I think it's easy to blame globalization rather than indivi individual responsibility. But ultimately, I'm from the school of thought that believes that, you know, people who are overweight should share, uh, should uh, carry some of the blame. And... Uh, you know, you might say, yes, there are people, especially in the Pacific Island, and I'm no expert, and perhaps I should keep my mouth shut, but my sense is that, yes, some parts of the world, people have a genetic predisposition to put on more weight, because historically, you know, food was scarce, and every time you add it, well, you know, you kind of become fat to survive the next famine. So, yes, of course, suddenly, you know, sugar, meat, everything becomes more abundant. There is a transition period, but I think, again, uh, having an obesity problem beats starvation and malnutrition and ultimately the more globalization you have the more people will have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and other alternatives and I think the problem will take care of itself if people are willing uh, to take care of it. So again, uh, if you define progress as the creation of a lesser problem than the one that existed before, I view that as progress. But is there room for improvement? Yes, of course. Yes? Yeah, I was in I I was in the poultry production business for a little while. And um, I went to a local uh, convenience store to try and sell some of my products. And he said to me, he says, you know, but, but the, the, the chicken you're selling me, I can buy cheaper from abroad. Mm -hmm. And I said, everything you sell in the store, I could buy cheaper from abroad. So the argument he was making against me, yes. I could make against him. And I say that to say, I think sometimes these things get caught in like maybe fabricated arguments. Like what? Like, like, let me give you an example. There's no such thing as globalized production. All production is done locally somewhere. <laughs> well, it's, it depends. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just shipped 
or transported somewhere? Well, it depends. A lot of inputs are often imported from further away, so fertilizers, pesticides. I don't know how much you manufacture here, but... Uh, I agree, but still produce locally somewhere. Because globalization really is the way we describe the net effect of what is done locally and then... Yeah, you know, how it's part of the web of yeah. international trade. But I like to view the planet as our <laughs> garden, personally. So for me, local is our planet, but yes. But, but at the end of the day, the point I'm making is not to even argue against the yes. arguments you make. Uh, I, I can't really, mm -hmm. in my own economic training, I can't. But to make is to say, what you said, suggesting, I think, is the Bahamas has to find... Some issues that you're very good at. Own, exactly. And produce, yeah. And I think what local farmers sometimes get caught in is they have a preference towards some particular uh, produce. Yeah. It's probably not the one that's best for you. Well, that's the problem in a market economy. Exactly. The people who call the shots are the consumers exactly. and producers have to obey. If, if consumers want and are willing to pay for something, producers have to listen to customers. And it's and not that, the other way around. That's the other point that I wanted to make is in yes. economics, we say that uh, all agents act rationally. Yeah. So if I want to buy a locally produced, inefficient, expensive product, that's my business. It is. And if there's a market there that's profitable for me to do so, okay. I can do that too. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I just wanted to ask quickly, yes, last night you uh, it talked about the kiwi. Yes. New Zealand Kiwi. Yes, okay, the example that I make is that um, a case that I read a few years ago was that in some parts of Italy, the young people were leaving, people were trying uh, new agricultural production, nothing was working until they hit upon Kiwis. And for some reason, Kiwis really took to some parts of Italy and today it's one of the world major producers. But it took some young people, I believe in their 20s, who were willing to try something really off the wall that older farmers really had never thought of, would have never considered, and they found their niche and they were able to bring back some prosperity to some rural town. So who knows, maybe some young people will try things that older people will never dream of and come up with something. Yes? Um, in my experience, I come from an agricultural country, basically, um, that evolved <coughs> The examples of localism or um, production for the local community, uh, the producers are highly integrated. Mm. Basically, they produce and offer it in perhaps a, a small shop or a restaurant for the very high end. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of trying to compete with international trade at the supermarket level mm. is not a good idea. Well, it, it depends who you are. Yeah. For a particular audience, yeah. at a high b value added, there yeah. may be an opportunity. Well, actually, if you're a small farmer, you've got two options. And if you want to remain independent, yes, you produce the Ferrari of food, you, do, you go for the niche market, or else you do like the new in New Zealand, Denmark, and other places. And you belong to a large agricultural cooperative. Right. I mean, you still have your farm, but you're part of this big network that will get help you get inputs cheaper and that will help market you your food. You still own your farm, but you're part of a bigger chain. So uh, I think ultimately it's up to the producers to find their niche. I'm never going to tell them what to do, but yeah, I think there are two options there. Yes? I'm rather curious. You mentioned kiwi fruit. Why is it that kiwi fruit that you buy, let's say, in West Palm Beach or Miami is almost a third cheaper than the New Zealand kiwi fruit. They both are the same product. Okay, I'm not familiar with the West Palm Beach case. I would have to look uh, at let's it. Let's just say the United States or South Florida. Okay, well, if, if they're... The, okay. It's almost a third cheaper than it is, let's say, in Athens or in uh, Christchurch or in uh, New Plymouth, New Zealand. Okay, well, I mean, uh, I would kind of question your premise there. I don't know. It might be that... Uh, there are economies of scale in shipping them to the United States. I don't know. I mean, I find that hard to believe. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm willing to believe you, but uh, I would have to look into the Kiwi markets. I mean, <laughs> typically, you know, uh, where I'm from and in most agricultural locations, you look for the best local food. It's typically in cities where people have more money. You never find it locally. So uh, I don't know if this is... Uh, but I honestly don't know. Maybe in West Palm Beach, they, maybe they turn it into a loss leader. Maybe they sell it at a loss to attract customers so that they buy other stuff. I honestly have no idea. I, I don't think so. But would that be a problem related to government? Now, for example, well, it might in this be. country, when you look at the price of food, yeah. prior to that, you could buy lower it. Lower is not a problem. Lower. 
It's not a problem. Well, it's a hell of a lot higher now. You could buy, in fact, <laughs> two and a half years ago, a can of camel beans. I, yes. I have one sitting on my shelf. It's 79 cents a can. That yes. same can today costs a dollar twenty-nine. Okay, well. So we are paying higher and higher prices, and not a lot of that well, uh, additional cost is absorbed by the government. Well, I was going to say, without knowing anything, I probably blame the politicians, but... Uh, okay, I, I don't know why things would go up that much in a year. I, I naturally tend, uh, tend to blame politicians. And I should know my brother was one. Okay, that's on tape. That one's true. Okay, any other questions? Yes? I don't think uh, a lot of this, your theories, apply to the Bahamas. Why would that be? Okay. Because... A lot of things that affect the cost of our food yes. are not the inputs for the food. Primarily uh, the cost of... Well, what about fuel, electricity, energy. and... Yeah, yes. all these things cause the price of our food to be high. Yes. But the, the good thing is, I don't think that we are absorbed in local, local worrisome either. Because okay. we are import almost a billion dollars worth of food. Yeah. So it means that we have an open mind to other yeah. people's food. Yes. But I think that what could be a good premise for us is the point you made, that we should be looking at things that we can grow mm -hmm. that is beneficial to us mm -hmm. and that we could look to export to well, other of countries as well. Yeah. So this in itself does not really apply to us. Yes. Okay. So you agree with me then? You agree with me. So you agree with me. Okay. Okay. As long as you agree with me, I'm fine. Yes. <laughs> there, 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 there. But, but, but please, there, there yes. is a psychology of local, local here. Though. Well, uh, there's a, that's the problem. You know, we're humans are essentially tribal animals. I mean, for all of our history. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you have a local uh, football team or rugby team or soccer team here, but, uh, you know, you, I'm from, uh, I moved to Toronto. Well, I guess most of you don't know much about hockey, right? That's the wrong audience. But let's just say that Toronto Maple Leafs have been the worst team in hockey for three quarters of a century. And yet people in Toronto still root for them, which has, being from Montreal, uh, well, okay, I'm sure you get the reference without getting it. So yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I know, it's a painful life. I think the last time they won the cup, I was not even born, so yes. You made the point that we wouldn't import food if we couldn't get it cheaper yes. or a similar quality. Yes. Um, would you like to comment briefly on this, uh, um, the issue of subsidies? Are there, there oh. certain well, I'm against them. I know. I'm against subsidies. I'm against barriers to trade. I think the best thing that advanced economies could do for economies that are trying to develop is remove subsidies, remove barriers to trade. And I'm reasonably active in the Canadian media on those issues, so I'm trying to do my little part. And but yes, an, obviously. And for an aiding kind. Well, of course. Of course. And no arguments there. Okay. So I think we might be done. <laughs>